Hi guys, this is Summer Camp 2020 session four, where we are going to talk about fun animal sports. And this is a really fun one for me because when I was uh, when I was researching all of this, I realized that there's so much more out there than just the dog sports, the canine sports that I teach in my real job. So I wanna first talk about what sports are and how I'm going to define it for today's session. Um, so first we breed many of our domestic animals for work, right? So, um, Maybe companionship could be considered a job, so a lot of our cats and some of our dogs. Uh, but some of those dogs also are bred to hunt. Um, and that's where we see some of the lure coursing and greyhound racing, that's based on hunting because they have like a little mechanical rabbit on a track that they, they chase or like a, a fake, um, we would call it a flirt, but it's like a, a toy on a string that is on pulleys that goes through a course and then the, the dogs chase it through the course and the one with the fastest times win. So we also have animals that plow fields or help on farms, but then we decided that maybe because we're people and we're competitive um, in many cases by nature, um, we decided maybe we would see if my horse, who I have on a farm, can pull more than your horse or my greyhound might be faster than your greyhound. And the only way to find out is if we put them together, right? And we time them and we come up with an event that uh, that can be kind of more sporting in nature than it really is realistically helping us in nature. Um, so a lot of the sports that we do with these animals are tapping into what they are historically bred to do. It just might look a little different. Um, but before we go on, we have to think about what sports are right? So many of you might really like playing or watching sports, as I was talking about earlier, and maybe these animals don't. So let's just kind of look, keep that filed away in the back of your head while we go on through this. So let's first look at what might be considered a sport and then see how these animals might play sports. So we have here um, a goldfish playing soccer, right? Is that a sport maybe you thought of before today? Uh, this has been recently in the news. Um, this is an old article, I think, from 2012, uh, underwatertimes.com, uh, but it's a goldfish playing soccer. And over here, we have a guinea pig doing an agility course. So I probably wouldn't take my fish to go and compete, right, with other fish, but I could teach my fish at home to do this sport. The same with the guinea pig and the agility. Boop. I'm just trying to skip my slide ahead here. And who should play sports? Well, that's something else that we should consider too, right? So in my research for today, I discovered that all sorts of animals participate um, in many kinds of sports. Uh, so I don't want you to think so much about which animals should play, but can they play or can we uh, adjust the sport or the rules to maybe make it so it's an appropriate game for this animal? So the way that I want to qualify sports today, given the kinds of sports out there and, and what these animals are bred to do, I want to qualify sports that the animal appears to be getting some kind of enrichment out of it, some sort of fun, some sort of uh, benefit out of it, like an emotional benefit as well as a physical benefit. And maybe in many of these cases, the human and the animal are getting the same benefit, maybe getting a stronger connection or a better bond because of the sport. Um, but I don't want these sports to be, appear punishing or aversive, uh, painful to the animal. It puts the animal's welfare at risk. And we're going to talk a little bit about that when we get to greyhound grazing. Um, there, are, there are people out there who would consider certain activities sports where the animals are killed or hurt or injured or not kept in good conditions. So I don't consider those sports. I consider that um, in some cases abuse, in some cases it's um, capitalizing on the animal for money and that when you're doing that, you're not putting the animal's welfare at the forefront. So these are just for fun activities that we're gonna be going over today that I would consider maybe a sport or a mentally stimulative activity. So the first thing we're gonna do is go over the silliest sports that I saw. And this one was my favorite by far. During these four weeks of presentations for you guys um, and instruction with you guys and lecturing with you guys, um, it has been super fun and I would 100% do it all over again. 
but I kind of feel like I can hang up my towel after this particular discovery. Um, snail racing is going to be very hard to top. I thought the, the Croatian bomb detection bees was going to be it, but no, snail racing. Um, so apparently you need to have, this is a real sport, you need to have two or more uh, terrestrial snails. So snails can be aquatic or terrestrial, terrestrial meaning land, terra, earth. Um, so you need to have these gastropods and you have yours. You might put it in the middle of a napkin, a wet napkin. And then the first one to the perimeter, which is the outside edge could win. Um, and it might take a while because they're snails. Um, so you don't want a particularly long course. Um, but yeah, this is a pretty cool sport. I guess like the first uh, official competitive live snail race was in London and they called it the Guinness Gastropod Championship. So one fun thing for you guys to look up today is maybe like, what is a gastropod? What qualifies as a gastropod? And I think that might be a fun activity for you today. Um, it was held in 1999. That's the year I graduated high school. Um, and it was commentated by a horse racing pundit, uh, John McCrick. Oh, sorry. John McCrickrick. McCrickrick. That is a hard name. I'll put it down here so you guys can see it. Uh, and he started the race with my, this is my favorite part. Ready, set, slow. Cause snail, it's so cheesy. I am so happy. Um, the next one we have here is horse soccer. This is another interesting one that I had never heard of before. Uh, this sport does look silly, right? Cause I mean, look at the size of that ball. I would love to play this sport. And then you've got like the two uh, barriers here. I don't know if you can, oh, maybe my pointer would work. So you've got the two little barriers here and these I think are the goal. Um, so this sport was actually created to help horses get out of confinement, out of stalls. Maybe they don't have a big enough pen so they get to run and stretch their legs and be a horse. Um, so this can help them move and play. And to, truth be told, animals in zoos and in captivity and even our domestic animals, like our dogs and our cats, um, can become stressed out if they're stuck in a confined area. And with you guys home at COVID, uh, with COVID, I'm sure some of you guys are a little stressed out too, maybe being confined with your parents or siblings um, without really having a break. So stress can cause a variety of, of maybe aggressive or even fearful responses in animals. So if you think about zoo animals or pets that are captured uh, in the wild and then confined to a courtyard or a cage, this could be a lot. So the domestic animals might even get anxiety living in confined areas. So equine behaviorists have long been uh, documenting and noticing the effects of that kind of stress on these animals. Um, so they decided to create a game for soccer to help these animals relieve tension, but also start working with people. Um, they enjoy playing with balls by themselves. You don't even need to have a sport. You don't need to have multiple horses. There's a, a, a ball that I've seen horses play called a jolly ball. And it's basically like this big rubber ball with a handle and you'll see horses like pick it up and run around. It's an enriching activity for them. Um, they can kick or nudge the ball towards the team goal. Um, which they would probably do anyway, which is super fun. The next fun one we're going to talk about today is bunny agility. And I am going to be honest here. I'm a little disappointed that they didn't just call it bunny agility because it's like right there, right? But, you know, they did the best they could. Uh, this is very similar to dog agility in that um, the animals here will go over jumps or through tunnels um, and it's a timed course. So the animal that goes through, the rabbit that goes through the course the fastest wins, but they have to do it with as few faults as possible. And a fault would be if he knocked over that bar where he's jumping over. So if you look down here, I've got my little pointer, um, this little jump bar here, he's going over it and the bars are up here too. Um, so when they go over that bar, if they knock it over, you would either add time, maybe five seconds for every jump that they hit or knock over a bar. Um, or if they go off course, if they go in the wrong order, uh, they might end up getting more time tacked on. Um, so the one with the fastest time and the fewest faults will win the competition. 
And again, you can use positive reinforcement training to train prey animals like rabbits or horses. And that's why I choose to use it when I'm training dogs and cats as well, because yes, people do think that you can use punishment to train animals and punishment can work, but it works better if you're using positive reinforcement. You want the animal to want to do the thing, not be afraid and held back because they're not doing it correctly. Um, if you try to use punishment on a rabbit to do an agility course, they won't do it. And here is my bread and butter. This is the, this is the part of my job that I love the most. As a dog trainer, I work with sports. I teach dogs how to play disc. I teach dogs how to play, how to do a sport called nose work and find really cool things with their noses. I got to teach, uh, I, I get to teach all sorts of fun things. I just get so excited about it. Um, many of you might have frisbees right in your home i'm i'm sure some of you might have even played with them in gym class or maybe had them in your home um, or have at least seen it but when we're talking about this sport we have to call it disc dogs or a canine disc and the reason is because the word frisbee is what we would call trademarked it's the difference between like kleenex and tissue right not every tissue is a kleenex kleenex is the brand it's the company that makes it but because they did such a great job at marketing we think of it as a Kleenex, right? But if I were to advertise my sport disc as Frisbee dogs, I could get in a lot of trouble by the people who make Frisbees, especially if I'm not using their discs, their Frisbees in my disc dogs class, which I wouldn't because Frisbees are, uh, human Frisbees are too big for our dogs to use safely. And the plastic of the disc absorbs the bite so it it, they, it punctures instead of breaks the disc in half and when you're a dog and you're catching these uh flying bits of plastic with your face you don't want it to break on you so the, we use very special discs called canine discs uh there's a couple of companies that make them for this sport um i generally would say don't use the ones that you would get at the grocery store or even ones that you would get at petco or PetSmart if they're in like the cheap disc bin those are the ones that'll break. And I've seen dogs have to get stitches on their gums. It's, it's not a good day when that happens. Um, so I, I do love this sport in that it's an umbrella term. Canine disc is an umbrella term for a lot of different games. There's one called frisgility where you're using discs and jumps and the dog has to go over jumps and catch discs. The sport down here, this is my friend Shadrach. And this is his dog. This is from years and years and years ago. And this dog started over here and jumped off his dad's chest and is going up here to catch this disc that he's throwing. Um, there's a degree in freestyle disc, which is what they're doing right here. It's basically um, gymnastics and dance and disc all at once and usually to music. Um, he's wearing, I wanna point this out to you guys too. You see this black vest here. He is wearing a special vest, a vaulting vest, and the, the technique that this dog here is doing, the jumping off of a body part, we would call that vaulting. So a dog can vault off your chest, your back, your leg, uh, a couple of other points on you as well, but those are the three big ones. Um, but we, we would never recommend that you let a dog do this unless you know exactly what you're doing um, and that you have this protective gear because dogs' nails, um, unlike a cat's nails that retract, a dog's nails are out and they're designed to dig and push dirt away. And when that's your body, I have seen people get horrendous scarring from a dog trying to jump off and push off to get a disc without appropriate protection. Um, so that's not a scar that you want to have on your body for the rest of your life. But this sport is so much fun. And this is one of the, the sports that I started uh, getting my, my uh, dog training chops on is in canine disc. And this was my dog, Sadie, over here on the left. Here she is. Um, and you can see how she, she found an unusual way of catching the disc here. She caught it with her head instead of with her face. And it was just such a cute picture, I had to put it in. Um, but there are other games too. There's distance accuracy, where you would have a, a diamond shape field with the ends lobbed off. So it, uh, and it's 50 yards, so half of a football field. And if you can throw that far and your dog can catch it, you get points and the more catches your dogs get at, at a certain distance, the more points you get. And the person with the most points goes on to win a trophy or a, or a medal or a certificate. 
Um, this is one of my favorite sports to teach, but it is kind of niche that we don't get a lot of dogs learning this sport as, as much as we did several years ago. Uh, there are other sports that seem to be more in favor, like canine nose work. And this is what our current dog captain does. Um, and if you've taken any of these other uh, summer camp sessions, almost every week we have talked about the power of a dog's nose, and this is no different. Um, narcotics and drug detection dogs use their nose to help uh, police officers find uh, illegal drugs or contraband airport dogs, COVID-19 dogs who are detecting COVID. Um, so we can go back to school and airports and be safe. Dogs do a lot for us humans, but if you have a dog and you don't want to put the pressure of the, on them of a real job, you could go ahead and you could do nose work, again, trademarked, or performance scent dogs or scent dogs. Like all of these are just different terms for this sport where a dog uses its nose to find a particular odor that you have trained. And online, I've actually been teaching my nose work students or my, my scent dog students to look for vanilla, like just putting Q-tip with a little bit of vanilla and teaching a dog how to find it. So if you're curious about that, send me a note and I will happily teach you guys how to get your animals to odor detect something that you have in your house right now. It's not that hard. It's pretty possible for most dogs um, and most handlers. So this is a sport that you could actually start today with your dogs. And, and again, I've, I've spoken at the, I've, I've had the pleasure to speak at the Museum of Science about how cool these dogs are and the things that they can find with their nose. So if you're curious about it, there's a, a Museum of Science presentation that I gave that I recorded in the first few weeks of COVID um, that you can find on my YouTube channel, or I can link to it here. I'll, I'll put it here or somewhere. All right, send your dog. Basic manners, sit, down, stay, and walk with me nicely. And you can do patterns around your house or around your yard or wherever you are. You can do rally obedience, which is a version of this where you follow signs like an agility course, but instead of jumps, you say dog sit or walk a circle around your dog. And if you get really into it, you can go and you can compete in this. And this is my daughter at, when, at the time she was four and she was doing our uh, she was handing out awards to our club members who earned uh, in our annual trial. I believe this was the rally team that went out. And then this is a dog getting his canine good citizen with his handler. This is my assistant, Nina, and, and now a dog trainer. I'm super proud of her and handling my dog, Captain, to get her canine, uh, her handling with him with a canine good citizen. There we go. I finally got there. And this is a friend of mine's dog, Lily, who's a great, representat uh, great representative of our sport. The ribbons that she earned with her mama and the toys that she weren't earned as, as a prize that is a little bit more tangible. Lily doesn't care about the ribbons. Lily cares about the toys. Um, and I kind of feel the same way sometimes. Now, Greyhound Racing. This is one that you might have actually seen. So at the beginning of all of this, I said that sports were supposed to be fun for the animals and that they would not be harmed. Um, this is a gray area. No pun intended, so sorry. Um, now, uh, let's see, I wanna make sure that I read this correctly because I don't wanna mess this up. Um, greyhounds have an instinct and that instinct is as a group of dogs called sight hounds is to find small prey animals and chase them really fast and hunt. Um, they are the fastest dog that we have, and in part is because of this thing here called double suspension. And double suspension is just a fancy way of saying all four feet are off the ground twice in one stride. So when they go through one stride of running, their feet are off the ground twice, whereas every other dog breed is only one time. So that helps them cover a lot of ground really quickly. Um, they would sprint after the prey, they would catch it, they would kill it, and then the hunter would come and collect the dead prey. Voila, we have dinner. 
But over time, we've stopped using them as hunting dogs, but they still have this instinct to chase. This is something that is bred into them and, and it's really hard to turn off. And some dogs have more prey drive than others, um, but that's, the, that's what we're playing with here with this particular sport. Now, greyhounds as a general rule love to chase things that are small and fuzzy and fast like rabbits or squirrels, right? And again, they can hit 40 miles an hour in two strides, and that is faster than the speed limit in Somerville. So that's really fast. Um, so since they have this instinct and people still like to make money, we have greyhound racing, which isn't great as a gig for most greyhounds. They're born into our racing kennel. They live on the track. They live in kennels. They go out, they play with other greyhounds, but for the most part, they are just there to eat food, sleep in a kennel and race and make somebody a lot of money. Um, they don't live in homes with people. Um, many of the greyhounds that I get right off the track might be really fearful of new experiences because they've never seen anything but the inside of a track. So knowing how stairs work, we have to train these greyhounds how to use stairs or that windows, you can't walk through them because they've never seen them. So this can all be very overwhelming to a three or four year old greyhound who got out of racing because of injury or because he wasn't fast enough or she wasn't fast enough. So for the most part, greyhounds are only useful if they're until they're hurt or they stop making money for the, for the track. So most greyhounds get out of a track when they break their leg or get really hurt. And that's what happened to our greyhound Zeppelin. And this is him here on my wedding day with my husband. Um, so, and that's my border collie from the disc dogs part from earlier. So, what had happened to him was he fell on the track, he was going really fast and he broke his leg and then he ended up with a bunch of screws in it and then he ended up being relinquished and we ended up adopting him and he was such a great dog. He was a 40 mile an hour couch potato. He was basically a 75 pound cat. Um, he was so great, but he did have these scars from this sport. That's all to say, there are better ways to do a sport that these dogs clearly are driven that we have bred them to do without the pressure of putting them on a track. There's a sport called lure coursing and it's a four fun sport that you can do with your dogs. Um, they live with you and then you can train your dog to do lure coursing or you could just get a group together and just do it for fun instead of the competitiveness of this, which is really just to make money. Um, these dogs have so much more they can offer and living their lives on a track is such a shame. We have sheep herding, the real life application of, of sheep herding sports and, and uh, sheep herding trials. It stems from these very real dogs who do this work every day on real farms. Um, they help farmers keep sheep together, move them from pasture to pasture. They help find missing sheep. Um, but if you wanna see how your sheep dog stacks up against these other dogs, or if you wanna see how your sheep dog um, performs for speed or how your skill as a shepherd, because uh, this is seriously a team sport, your, your dog has to work with you to bring in these sheep. And if there's a missing one, you have to help guide your dog to you using just whistles. Um, it's pretty fun to watch and if you ever get a chance to watch these dogs in action, I highly encourage it. You can Google it, you can search for it. Um, if you can ever go to a fair or a festival and you can watch these dogs in action on a field where they're doing sheepdog demos, 100% go watch these dogs. It is incredible. Um, so in this, in this picture here, so I'm just playing with goats. I used to have longer hair, guys. Um, I'm playing with some goats here. This is my friend. Willie, who's helping section out some sheep. So we put all the sheep or the shepherd here, put all the sheep into this pen and it's like a long narrow pen. So the, uh, the shepherd could pull out maybe 10 sheep that she wanted to work with. And if there was one coming up to the front of the gate that she didn't want to work with, she would open one side and the sheep could go back out in the pasture. And if there was a sheep she wanted to work with, she could open a second door and that sheep would have to go straight into a second pasture so she could work, um, so she could work with her dog. So here's Willie helping separate out the sheep. Um, and then she used the second dog to actually practice, like maybe taking two sheep out and then eight sheep out somewhere else and then going to collect two and bringing them back. It was so fun to watch. So I highly encourage um, all of you to uh, look up sheep herding today. 
All right, guys, and here's the last section for today, and it's going to be about horses, because I think some of you might think about horse racing and some other sports. We've already covered greyhound racing, uh, which is a little bit different than horse racing. Horse, horses do generally live with a trainer and an owner, um, or at least the owner, and then the trainers come in and they get riders. So it's a little bit different than the greyhounds who just live at the track. Um, so we're not going to cover horse racing here, but if you're curious about it, you can certainly look that up. I'm just trying to find my notes here, and here we go. Let's get into horses, barrel racing. So how many of you guys wanted to grow up to be a cowboy or a cowgirl uh, and saw this as like just like a really cool way to interact with a horse and race and have fun out in the, out in the middle of nowhere? Uh, I grew up in, in a rural area. I did not grow up in a city, and I got to do some of this when I was a kid, and I cannot... I cannot express how fun this is, <laughs> riding a horse like this and going for time. And you don't even need to compete against other people, but if you have a particularly fast horse and this is something that you are interested in doing, absolutely get a horse or borrow a horse and learn how to do this sport. And here's a, a, a variation of a theme in barrel racing, but you have three barrels on uh, each of the points here. Let me get my little pointer up. You have a barrel here at this X, a barrel here at this X, and a barrel here at this X. And the goal is to run these barrels in a defined pattern, and the pattern can change. You might sometimes have to do the top barrel first, and then left, and then right. Um, but in this particular pattern, you have to, you, the start, uh, the timer starts as soon as you cross this red line, the timer line. So timer hits go as soon as your horse crosses here. You go to the right, you go to the left, and then you do the top and you come down. The winner of these races is often only determined by less than one thousandth of a second. It, it, that is less than the time it takes you to blink your eye. Um, these horses are remarkably fast and you can hit the barrel. Like the, the idea is to like shave time is to get as close to this barrel as you can. She's actually pretty far away here. Um, but she also seems to know that her horse is a uh, leaner, so is going to likely knock this barrel over. So she's got a really good distance for this horse. If that barrel goes over, you add, I think it's five seconds, or it depends on the rules of the particular game that you're playing. But if you add five seconds and the top 10 horses are all in within one thousandth of a second, you've lost the race. So you do not want to hit these barrels. If you do hit it and it doesn't knock over, you're in good shape. Um, but the problem is if you hit the barrel, um, this is just, again, I, I cannot tell you how fun this particular sport is. Now, this is a sport that I did when I went to, um, to college. So last week we talked a lot about, um, jobs you can do as a grown up when you get big, how you can start working with animals. And one of them is to work in the equestrian world, the horse world. Um, you can be a teacher or a trainer, or you can manage a barn or a racetrack. Um, There's so many different ways that you can go. But if you really love just working with horses um, and you like competing with horses, uh, here is one variation. Show jumping, uh, I cannot tell you how fun this is. <laughs> it's like, um, in this case, uh, a rider and a horse run a circuit of jumps, very much like agility, but instead of tunnels, it's just jumps. Um, and the team with the fastest time with no faults, remember we talked about faults before, that's if you hit a bar or you go off course and you lose, you get more time added to your time after the end based on everything that you hit or go off course. Um, so it's mistakes. Um, but you can look up later the Olympics, show jumping Olympics. Um, and you'll see some really fascinating uh, feats of athleticism with these horses and how calm and cool and collected the rider and the horse are that they move together and do these jumps. Um, but you can also do it for fun. And in this case here, the, the article that I got this from was from the George Towner. Oops, I'm so sorry. Is from the George Towner from 2019. The name of the article, the joint was jumping at the Washington International Horse Show. Oh my goodness, my screen. Um, so she is dressed up as Cruella de Vil from Disney's uh, 101 Dalmatians, and her horse is also dressed as a Dalmatian. You can see here that she has fabric on here. This is not paint. Um, so these horses, this horse does have like a particular fabric 
on it, uh, fabric attachment and adhesive. It does not hurt the horse. Um, and she ended up winning. Uh, let's see, I believe, let's see, by the way, this team on the screen earned the best costume award in the $35,000 International Jumper Accumulator Costume class. Um, it's a pretty great costume, isn't it? Um, and here is the piece de resistance, like the best thing that I ever saw when I was a kid. Uh, the thing that got me wanting to work with horses when I was younger and eventually enrolling in a school, Lake Erie College, that has an equestrian program. You can learn to be a teacher trainer. I, I talked about it in last week's class. Um, equestrian vaulting. Now, this is dance plus music plus gymnastics on a horse. Ah, it's so crazy. So if you look here, let me get my little pointer up. You might not be able to see this, but there's a handle here. This is a particular saddle. It's called a trick saddle. Um, and it's got extra handles on it. It's got a flatter back so she could do a handstand as her horse is running around. Um, it's You'll often see this also in circuses. She's got another handle over here. So she is in a full split as she's on this horse that is running. This line that is attached to the horse here is called a lunge line. So they have a person in the middle of the ring and the horse is running a circle around the person in the middle as the horse is lunging or running in a circle. Um, and she is doing her routine on the back of a horse. So if you've ever watched the Olympics and you have seen the, um, the pommel horse, that's that's so stationary and so boring once you've seen something like this. So if you can do gymnastics and you can do it on the back of a horse, you win athletics. Like that seems like such a fun sport. And the horse gets to, you get to work with your horse. I'm sure you fall a lot. So you have to be okay with falling, but you have to really trust your mount. Um, that's what you would call a horse that you're working with, a mount. In this case, this is uh, from the New York Times from two years ago. Elizabeth Osborne is the name of the competitor here. And her horse's name is Sting, and they were competing in Germany. Um, so I really hope that you guys enjoyed today's presentation. Um, here's where I got most of today's information. The dog stuff was all stuff that I, I knew from working with dogs. Um, the Greyhound racing, you can look up. Um, actually, I think Great 2K is a great resource if you're interested in Greyhounds and and lure coursing, you can Google lure coursing. Um, we also have uh, disc dogs, uh, hyperflight.com and skyhounds with a Z it are two great resources for disc dogs. And what was the other dog sport that we did? We did, oh, and nose work. Uh, that would be NACSAW, N-A-C-S-W, uh, North American, uh, canine scent work association, I think, but it's Naxaw. I'll put it up in here. I'm so sorry. I'm flaking on it. I need another cup of coffee. You can also look up performance scent dogs as well. Um, if you're curious about any of the other things that we have been discussing over the last few weeks, feel free to reach out to me. My name is Melissa. Um, I, uh, I wrote a book called Considerations for the City Dog. It is something that I am very proud of and that I, um, I worked really hard at writing in 2015. And we will be uh, discussing it in the book club later on this week uh, through Every Dog Training Center. If you guys are curious about what it's like to write a book or what it's like to work with dogs, you guys can ask questions there as well. Um, but again, thank you so much for joining me through Summer Camp 2020. Next week, we're gonna be talking about animal to changed history, including dogs who were spies and maybe pigeons who have changed the course of World War I. So we're going to be talking about historical animals next week. Thank you for joining me again. Enjoy your week and ha yeah, have a good one. Later. <laughs>